Welcome to the Knock on Archery podcast, where we bring all archers and bow hunters together from all walks of life with the goal to educate, empower, and inspire you to be better both in the field and on the range. Check this out. What do you think? That's pretty cool. All right. Well, let's freaking get it going. Is this how I normally sound? (laughs) That's exactly how you sound. I thought more of an Antonio Banderas type sound, but okay. It's morning. Oh, yeah. We've we've done some morning podcasts just because we're, I don't know, having too much fun during the day. (laughs) And I say we just mean me and whoever's been here. You know, first first thing we say is let's do a podcast. But then food starts and beverages and archery and, you know, being outside and all that good stuff. Well, your place is like the, you know, the fantasy factory, you know, Rob Deerdex. <laughs> yeah. That's what your that's what this place reminds me of. I've got a buddy of mine that's talking about building a real fantasy factory, which I know would put this to shame, but I don't know. I think I, I don't know if it's a fantasy factory, it's just everything I like in one place. Or I shouldn't say one place. There's like it's an area, right? Is that a good way to say it? Area, a, a play area, right? Exactly. <laughs> so this is Isaac Aylman, the one and only. Dude, we have to we have to go way back. So when did we first meet? We were trying to figure this out. So I met you before I was even working in the industry. I was actually working for the DMV, <laughs> Utah. <laughs> Dang. All right. I was working there and a mutual friend of mine I went to high school with, Brian Reed, he was working at Hoyt. Oh, yeah. And he invited you over for a Halloween party. (laughs) And I remember you walking in. I'm like, who's this giant with that cool watch on? (laughs) I remember you had a cool, you had the Oakley watch at the time. Yeah. Yep. And Brian said, oh, that's John Dudley. You know, he's an archer. I'm like, okay. And I was still new to archery at the time. So, because I got an archery in two thousand five, is when I really dove into archery. Yeah, because you were. I do remember you were green, and I remember, I remember like the jealousy that came soon after once once you like <laughs> learned to strike <laughs> because you you got after it. And we'll get to that. So yeah, so it was about two thousand eight. I met you at a party, and that was the first time I met you. Was then, and I don't know if you remember, but. After that, <laughs> I'm trying to think. So after that, a lot of people don't know is when I, I left the DMV, because I was there for nine years for the state of Utah. So I worked nine years for the state and my wife worked for the mortgage company. Well, mortgage mortgage company went down. So she ended up getting a job at the state. And I was like, well, sweet. You got the benefits, honey. I'm jumping ship. <laughs> and I actually got a job for customer service at Easton. So I worked at Easton for four months over there in the customer service department. And that's when I met you again there. And that's when you were doing the Rambo Island hunt. Oh, dang. All right. We'll get to that. So were, were you there? Were you there when I was like shooting in the back? In yeah. The, in, at, well, I was shooting out behind the Easton Center? Yes, you were. And I remember it was Cody's the one that took you out. And I'm like, I wanted to go out there, but I had to stay stuck up to the phones. <laughs> Because it was customer service. I remember you now. Because you, you were like one of the bubblier ones. Was McNail still there? Yeah, McNail, yeah, McNail was still there. Was yep. there. So I would have been with McNail. Yep, you were with McNail. Yep. Okay. Yep, my mentor. He's been like my mentor through this thing. That's awesome. So I met you there. And when I, I ended up going to ATA the first time. So customer service, went to ATA, you know, with uh, Easton. And everyone just knew I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, whoa, <laughs> this place is amazing. So we did the ATA show, and I was always friends with the guys over at Badlands. I mean, because just from just the days at the DMV, I was just a fan of backpacks. That's the way I've always hunted. Yeah. So I got to know them, and it was funny because I'd always go over there and help them out when they'd have like a show or something Yeah. or a sell. And when I was at you know the ATA show, they go, wow, we – and you come on up, Isaac, good for you. And it wasn't until a month after he pulled me aside and he said, I want you to be the sales manager for Badlands. I'm like, bro, I didn't even go to college. <laughs> All right, I don't know anything. And the owner of Badlands said, don't care. You're passionate. 
let's go ahead and I want to make you my sales manager. I can teach you whatever you want. And that was Bill. That was Bill. Yep. Bill yeah. Crowley. I always liked Bill. A good dude. The this is the funniest part of the story is people, you know, probably don't believe this, but he told me when he hired me on because I didn't want to leave Easton. I wanted to try to work my way up at Easton. And he said, if I hire you as a sales manager, Isaac, I promise you, Easton would want to hire you back five year in five years as a sales manager. No lie, that happened. <laughs> I was at Badlands for five years, almost to the month. And that's when Easton started making backpacks, and they hired me away from Badlands to Did go work for them. Because you had worked with Sean, right, Monson? Yep. Because yep. because uh, Full Moon Productions, FMP was out, right? Yes, they were out. Yep. And Full, they were in their prime. They were in their early prime. Exactly. Yeah. They're the ones, I would have to say, between, you what know. What was the first one? 360. The, well, was there one that had like a silver spoon or something on the cover? Was there one with a spoon on the cover? Yeah, there's one with a spoon. That was proof. proof oh, yeah. Proof, proof, proof in the proof. pudding. <laughs> yeah. That was the yeah. later one. Yeah, okay. Yep, I remember the, that. Their first one was 360, and the reason that one resonated with me so much is they hunted the area, the Wasatch Front, that I grew up hunting yeah. with a rifle, but then they made it archery only. So, I mean, I was a, when I was hunting, I was, like, against archery. I'm like, damn, they made the Wasatch Front archery only? That's stupid. I was pissed I'm like i'm never gonna archery hunt that's awesome <laughs> i didn't hear that part that's cool so i want to back up one more time did you have side hustles like early on because right now you're a side hustler dude you you freaking hit you hit like pawn shops you hit everything and you just like you flip anything that's got nostalgia right right exactly well even so back then that's when i did start my side hustling well you know so I'm thinking, like, what was going through your head going into that ATA show, dude? Just, like, the biggest pawn shop on earth. I was more, what gear do I need? I'm a gear hoarder. Bad. <laughs> I'm so bad. And, you know, like I said, I've, I, I've always kind of had my little side hustles and hustling because, again, you know, when you work for the state of Utah, you don't make much money. Yeah. And I was doing it for the benefits. And I was a dad at an early age. I mean, I met my wife. She had... Uh, you know, she, she had a two-year-old daughter, and I'd been raising her. So at 18 years old, I became an instant dad. So you know, we struggled all those years, and to make ends meet just to buy hunting gear, I would hustle. I would go around, uh, you know, yard sales. I would go anywhere I can to find something to flip. Yeah. And that was my goal. Now, when it went to the ATA show, it didn't go much from uh, – I didn't do much of the flipping. I did more of the bartering. Okay. <laughs> it's the barter system. <laughs> yeah. And again, something I'm thinking like, this, this is great. And then somebody says, oh, the barter system. I'm like, well, what's that? They go, you didn't pay attention in school, did you? <laughs> <I'm> like, no. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> That's freaking awesome. So then uh, you ended up, well, at Badlands, I think that's when you really started to like, put some roots out within the industry because yes. you were able to like call people, talk to people. You weren't like restrained within the, the cubicle walls of a customer service person on the phone at, at Easton. Exactly. Um, over at Badlands, they had me, you know, they told me, you know, you're going to be a sales manager. We want you to work with sales managers, uh, the accounts, the sales reps, marketing, customer service. And one of the things was Badlands was so, you know, it was kind of new at the time. Yeah, it was. It and was. we, I mean, we didn't have a budget. Yeah. And so he goes, give out free backpacks, get that exposure. That's your goal. And I'm like, no problem. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> Freaking side hustle. Here we come. Exactly. What <laughs> do you and need? burn, baby. <laughs> and that's what it became. I mean, went down to having a list of just people and just connecting people. Candyman well, Isaac freaking rolling in, bro. It's, it's, Backpacks for everybody. Well, it's, it's like that saying, you know, I always tell my son, I go, I want this, you know, on my gravestone. It's not what you know. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. <laughs> oh, damn. All right. And if you look, that's where I started making all the connections. Because, again, you know, the connection with to you was Brian Reed. Yeah. Brian's friends with Cooper, Zach. Yeah. Knew you. Started making the connections, and then you ended up in the office of Badlands. Dude, what if Zach becomes president of freaking Hoyt? I know. That is crazy. <laughs> is that nuts? That is nuts. Like, just 
everything from like that freaking was it a halloween party yeah it was a halloween did party. i dress up no because you can't you were hunting the front with uh cooper oh damn that's right that is right yeah and daniel i think yep and daniel, daniel was sleeping in uh cooper's spare room yep because he had just started at Hoyt. he was new i mean all those guys were new i mean even zach was pretty new over zach there. was brand new yeah daniel was brand new i mean cooper it was at that time it was uh cooper and jason fogg see that yeah, that's who, that's who it was. Cooper and Cooper and Fogg was like who who were the the mainies. And I remember because when I first started at Hoyt, um, I was pretty lucky because no one could really get in the engineering lab. So uh, I would go there, and Randy was okay with like I couldn't be in their little cubicle area for too long. Because I think Gideon had maybe just started as, like, heading up uh, engineering. But they would let me go up above on that mezzanine. Oh, yeah. So I would go up there and just um, – they would just bring me all kinds of different bows so I could put them together and shoot them in my draw length. And then um, I was just doing product reviews, like bow reviews. So I really wanted – and I wanted to learn because I had been at Matthews for 10 years. So – like, I knew what everyone shot with Hoyt, but that didn't mean I could answer every question. So I just said, like, bring me a bow each day and let me let me, let me me set it up, shoot it, tear it apart, look at the individual parts. And I, was, I would literally do that and then take pictures up on that big white table. I'd take pictures of everything. I called it exploded. So I'd take everything off and lay it out like, like the bow had exploded on the table to where I could take pictures and then... Anytime someone would ask me, at least at that time, you know, hey, what kind of, you know, what do you think of X, Y, and Z of a bow? And then I could, like, pull up that file, and then I could see it exploded. And then as soon as my brain saw it exploded, it would construct it back together. And I could I could talk about, like, any model. But it wasn't because I had been – I even knew anything about Hoyt for so long. It was because those days just being able to go up above the mezzanine – and take something off the floor and just blow it up more or less to where, you know, I would take a whole puzzle piece apart, like dumping a box out on the table. And then my mind could put it back together. And that's how it started. Were you at Easton when I first, like when, so when, um, when I left Matthews and I was like on my own, I really didn't know what I was going to do yet. I just knew that, well, I knew that Matthews, was butt hurt and said either you work inside for us under our rules or you're not having a shooting contract which was insane especially <laughs> at the time I was like had like number 2 ranking and number 1 ranking you know for international stuff for for Matthew shooters so it was just insane that it was like either you you know play in our sandbox this way or you know we're you're not allowed in type thing so I knew that I was going to work for another archery company, and, and I talked to um, John Shepley and then um, was it John Stram, who was at Bowtech way back? Was he like one of the original owners? And then um, Stratham or something? Uh, and then Struthers? No, that was um, Kevin Struthers, okay. but he was there too. Okay. Um, and then I talked to, well, George Tekmachoff and Darren knew right away when I left uh, Matthews. They couldn't believe it. And they called and said, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, I really don't know. I just know that I'm going to be in the archery industry. I'm going to, you know, and I said, maybe Matthews will call me back tonight. And, like, you know, this whole thing will just blow over. And they just said, well, if that's the case, we want, like, if it doesn't blow over, we want to talk to you. So I just said, well... I'll talk to you guys, but I'm not going to come to Hoyt because I had a um, severance. So I said, I'm not going to come to Hoyt, but we can meet, we'll meet on neutral ground. And so I met them at Easton okay. and went out back. And you know, at, at the school, that target that's up at the top of the stairs with that bow on it? Yeah. That's the first bow um, the engineering department at Hoyt ever built for me. I mean, it was mainly Zach. Oh. And, it was mainly Zach and Darren. Okay. So they're like, 
we think this is the bow that you would shoot in competition because it best matched the specs of the apexes, which I was shooting like lights out at the time. So I went to Easton and I said, well, I need to shoot the bows to make sure the, like I can get along with a Hoyt. And I had, I had appointments at PSE and Bowtech that same week. Cause I was just going to kind of talk to everybody and just listen. But I went out back and that's when I shot that 1428 out behind Easton. I know it was, I mean, it couldn't have been more than like a year before you saw me there the first time. So I wonder if you were there. You might not have even known because no. it was so secretive, you know, that I was even out there. Well, because when, no, when I was at Easton, I think you were already signed. I'd have been in 07, I'm thinking, because mm. I started Easton. 06 and, is when and, that was. Oh, yep. Yeah, okay. So, oh, I, I, I want to say it was October 2007 is when I went was when I finally left the government job and went to Easton. So that's when, because you already, like I said, when you came there, you were doing the Rambo Island hunt. Yeah. So. <laughs> Which was a pretty dang cool hunt. It was, it was fun. That was a good, like, learning tool. Honestly, I think, I think in the right situation, that would be a really awesome way for like new bow hunters to get the experience of like, oh, you're going to go to BC or Alaska and do like a boat trip, like a boat in camp out yes. type. Tri like it would have been perfect for that. A, oh, week yes. a weekend hunting spot where we would take this uh, shrimp. I thought it was a shrimp boat. It was like a shrimp boat, but it, it was on the greater salt lake. It's in the great salt lake. Yeah. So there's this island. There's a few, there's two islands of great salt lake. There's Antelope Island, which you could drive to. Yep. And there's Fremont Island. Yep. And Fremont Island's owned privately. And you can only get there by plane or boat. Yep. And you guys went, because I ended up hunting that same island a few years later. Yep. But you can only get there by plane or boat. And you guys took a boat out there. And I think it was like the brine shrimp. We have brine shrimp in yeah, the water. Yeah, yeah. it was. You guys I, when, I tell people, when I tell people it was a shrimp boat, there you know, there's a lot of people like, what are you talking about? But no, I remembered it was a shrimp boat. And the plane couldn't land because of the wind. Yep. And so they're like, we can't get you out there. And we're like, well, what what's going out there? And they said, we might be able to see if you can pay this freaking <laughs> captain to jump on the shrimp boat. And so that's what we did, dude. We just freaking... Like, they barely got us to shore and then just kind of kicked us out. And they said, like, we'll come we'll come back at, you know, whatever time. And when we were on the island, we could see that boat, like, start coming. And we had to, like, get all of our crap together and get out there. And I think we'd shot a few. Um, they had, like, free, ro free roaming um, rams and stuff out there. Yeah. And... Uh, and then I think they shut it down because they were worried about those swimming across. Well, no, not swimming. There is a part of the Great Salt Lake that freezes and a little section where the water actually freezes and then they can go cross over to Antelope Island. Okay. And then also they had uh, boars on there. Oh, that, that's what killed it. Yep. They had the <laughs> yeah, pigs on there. When they, and so yeah, that's, that's what, that's cause, what did Because the island was like 12 miles by 12 miles, something like that. No, it was know. one mile wide. I remember okay, that. Was it that. It was a mile wide by, I think, 12 miles long. Oh, okay, that's what it was. Yeah, and we freaking covered, like, a lot of that sucker. Yeah, that was a unique, I mean, I lived in Utah my whole life and didn't, didn't realize, you know, what. That was a fun deal. That, that was a different I mean, place. for anyone out there who has, you know, essentially, like, a, a small Hawaiian island in the middle of a freaking massive lake, <laughs> put a few animals out there and let people get the experience of, like, well, I remember like we had to pack 50 pounds or less because originally you're we supposed to fly, you know, super cub. Yep. So like, you know, just learning like how to pack tight and then, you know, landing on a beach, getting off and then obviously taking care of your animal, like without someone being out there, you know, once, once you actually get the animal down, very open country, totally DIY. It was, it was a really cool, um, it was a really cool prep. I think if you did that, you would have no problem in Alaska doing like brown bear or coastal or anything. Well, you got to bring that back, bring that video back, show that hunt. Dang. Yeah, it was, I was a freaking punk. dude. <laughs> I just remember, I just remember being, I, I was having so much fun though. I mean, it was like, I had this for 10 years, 
at Matthews, I was like so restricted on what I could do like at, in a personal life. Um, and I, like, I won't go into detail about it, but I just like, I was under the biggest m- microscope and magnifying glass that I've ever had in my whole life, you know, and just wasn't allowed to like drink or be around it or like all kinds of stuff like that. And, and honestly, I never did it. Like I never did it. But when I finally left, I was so tired of like all these pressures of like, you know, everything you do is a sin or, you know, can't drink or watch your, you know, you can't talk this way or whatever. Well, that, isn't that like some target archery though? I mean, you can't even wear camouflage. Is that true? Oh yeah. Yeah. You can't like, I remember, uh, we had a really cool, uh, recurve that we made for Rod White and, um, it had a really cool real tree, uh, extra Brown pattern that had like gold flake in it. It was really neat. And we made it for him for the, uh, 2000 games. And when he got there, they totally protested that camo, and he had to he had to peel it all off his bow. No way. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't really wear a camo. But it wasn't. It was more internal. It wasn't the external portion of like target archery. It was it was the internal portion. And I remember when I left, I just finally said, you know, if if everyone's so worried about me, you know, freaking drinking or you know going to a party then i'm just gonna do it and i i literally was like when i see when i have friends that were homeschooled and they like you know and then you see them the first like year in college when they've finally been able to get out and like not have you know they're able to like eat however much candy they want or freaking drink or like you know see freaking chicks or whatever it is <laughs> that was me like when i left and i did that hoyt deal and it was like you know darren and and zach and freaking reed and Daniel and uh driffel yep. because you know like going up to the bear camp in idaho with those dudes and stuff yep. i was dude i was the freaking homeschooled kid <laughs> getting let out of the freaking cage and yeah that's when it all started <laughs> How was I, what, what, what did we do at that Halloween party? Was there anything, was I pretty cordial or did yeah, I get Yeah, you were pretty chill, dumb? actually. Did I get you were dumb? Pretty, you were pretty chill, actually, over there. Darren, because honestly, I knew either I had to watch myself or Darren did, because Darren could go way off the deep, deep end. Well, see, but you guys were hunting the next day. Oh. That's because you had that, you know. That I was in hunt contact. mode then. Yeah. If I'm in hunt mode, then I'm, I'm like, pretty freaking like eye of the tiger stuff yeah. so you you were hunting then so i think that's why you didn't go too bad so at that time you hadn't killed a mule deer yet though with your bow oh no 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 because no. that came probably that came while i worked at easton actually oh it did no it did come when i worked at easton but that actually i that's the year i did kill a matter of fact i met you because that had been oh seven and i didn't and so yeah, that was 07. Yeah, Double D was 08, I think. So Double D was 08. So I don't think... Well, we were filming in 07. But yes. the first the first release was 08, I'm pretty sure. Per, yep. So yeah, that was that was the first. So I believe I killed, ended up killing that November is when I ended up killing. I met you that October, I want to say. Yeah, because I remember those guys saying, you remember Isaac? And I said, yeah, yeah. And they're like, dude, well... Yeah, it had to have been because we were Badlands. Like you watched, you pitched our first pilot to Bill. Yes, and Badlands was like one of our, you know, one of our financial supporters. Well, because it was at ATA, I was you know again with Easton. I'm just a customer service guy, and I heard about your trailer to your double D bow hunting. Yeah. Now people got to remember this is back in the day when you know it was DVDs. It wasn't social media or YouTube. It was straight DVDs. Yeah. I mean, or VHS or VHS. Yeah. But it, you, I mean, you were not, you were anything unless you had, you know, a DVD to show and bring to somebody. And all the DVDs back then were the same country music or, you know, horrible, horrible. I mean, you see, if the, you watch the first 10 seasons of monster bucks, that's what you saw on every pilot that was at the ATA show in those days. 
And we had that big screen TV over there with, hooked up to a DVD player. And I heard about this trailer, and I asked you and Cooper, and you, I remember you go, well, let's just put it on right here. And I remember oh, you put the right. DVD on, that big screen TV, and that song hit. Yeah. And it was like a rock video. Fort Minor yep. was our freaking, <laughs> yeah. Fort Minor and Saliva were... Yeah, that was, that was, uh, it changed a lot because actually people seeing it at that booth Mm -hmm. is when, uh, we ended up having, uh, Kip Folks from Under Armour saw it and ended up saying like, dude, that's exactly like the style I want for Under Armour. Cause at the time, the only one that was at Under Armour then was, um, well at first Waddell was there for a very short period of time and then Waddell was gone when they weren't doing real tree and then cam was like you know cam was the first and yeah so, but that's back when he was still with eastman's and it was still he was still pretty green i mean not he was brand well. new with ua yeah. at that time yeah. and then i remember talking to kip and kip was like yeah here's my number and you know here's like my personal assistance number and he's like you know we're starting ua a ua hunt division and at the time back on that dvd there were no camos yet on the on the clothing no, it was solids and they had heat gear and cold gear and i remember when i went on that hunt i remember thinking like cold gear is good for like in the cold i didn't realize like you would freeze to death if you <laughs> had that because I, I i just put like that cold gear on you know and you liked how you looked in it because it would suck everything in oh yeah but like the first jackets and stuff that they had were, you know, they were all kind of like gym shocky solids. Yeah, they and, were, huh? and, and yeah, yeah. But arguably the best beanie and the best gloves still to this day were like the first three years of UA's beanies and gloves. They were so <laughs> freaking awesome. I wish they would get ripped off and I'd wear them again in a freaking heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's how it started. And then um Jared uh from Lone from Lone Wolf like heard about it and uh because I think Kip introduced us Realtree and said like, Hey, I really like these guys. I think we're gonna work on Realtree with, with UA. And then uh Chris from Realtree ended up taking me over to Lone Wolf and we put that pilot in with Lone Wolf and that that was kind of how it started. Yep. Well, I, well, if you remember, though, when it came to over at Badlands, we really didn't have a marketing budget. And so, because back then, I mean, we never paid anybody, you know, to wear our packs because yeah. there wasn't a budget. I mean, you know, Bill Crowley, he owned it. And, you know, small, I mean, we were still a small company back then. And the, remember, the way we worked your deal was I said, okay, let's do this. Let's buy your DVDs from you. Oh, that's so right. So we bought the DVDs and then you gave we, them around, and then we put them in whenever we did a repair or customer service thing. We gave away that DVD. That's right. Holy crap! So I that's how that deal that, worked. Is we end up because we because we you know the way we worked it was he couldn't really justify just paying someone to wear the pack. Yeah. Instead, we bought your DVDs. Well, I remember. Uh, you know, you were like, hey, we have to, like, I have to have the sales to justify this. Yes. So I said, I will sell more packs right now. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you who to call yes. and, I'll, and I'll prime them and you'll sell more packs than what you're sponsoring us for. So I gave you, uh, well, we talked to Seppi. Yep. We talked to Johan, I think. Correct. And Donnie Zenner. Yes. Yes. See? Yep. That's yep. what yeah yeah so then uh yeah donnie's shop up in debolt alberta freaking yep. crushed badlands packs because i because i at the time i hunted in that area and I, I would always have that pack and no one had even like canada's always so late seeing something that's cool so they they were like where's this freaking pack and dude he had just the most amazing shop because it was like right between grand prairie like driving through Valley View and heading down towards um, back down to Edmonton or Calgary. So everybody that was hitting the pipeline and stuff was driving right past this little store. And it was like just the right distance from Grand Prairie. It was like the perfect distance between Grand Prairie and Valley View. And there was limited gas at the time. They had the only gas station right there. So (laughs) 
people would come out of the bush and these guys would come out with a fistful of hundred dollar bill, you know, a freaking roll of hundred dollar bills <laughs> back then and drive in and swing into that sports shop. And there would be, it's like everything double D had was right there. And, and at the time, Donnie wasn't filming at all. He was just like, yeah. well, this goes back. So, um, I remember I wanted to know at the time I was the international sales and marketing manager for Matthews. So I wanted to know like, who's our customers in Canada because there, we had two distributors up there and both of the distributors would not tell you who their customers were. Cause they just, they didn't want any, they didn't want a manufacturer yep. going direct. So they would not tell you they were just masters at dodging it. And you could tell they didn't want to give it away. So this was back in probably 05. Um, I thought, okay, I need to know. I kind of I kind of based it on the like 90-10 rule that like 10% of your customers will do 90% of your business. And so I, I kind of thought like, I wonder if these guys have 10 customers that are that big and there was two distributors yeah so um i had a pretty tight budget but i went and i pitched an idea to matt and i said i need 10 free bows and i said i'm going to try to find out who our best shops in canada are so i called each distributor and i said i want to give a bow to your top five dealers but i want to be able to call them and like tell them that this is an award from you and you know and so, and I, I like painted the picture of like, hey, we're going to call and like make you guys look awesome by giving this, this shop owner a free Matthews and a free uh, Matthews moment picture frame and just tell them like, this is an appreciation of, you know, uh, I think Trophy Book was one of the distributors, maybe Monson. And I said, um, and we'll tell them this is on behalf of Trophy Book, you know distribution or whatever so they were just like oh my god that's such a good idea these shops like our reps are going to be pumped they're going to sell more bows and so they gave me five names but one of the five was donnie yeah and so you know i called donnie gave him a matthews and everything and he just like said you know hey sometime you should come up to alberta and hunt and so you know, I, I kind of was always reluctant and he kept sending me these pictures of these muleys and I had never shot one. So I went up there and he also, well, I went up for muleys, but there was like a hunter host thing. Like it was called hunter host. And so like a resident could, could host a non-resident and you could like pick two species. So I picked elk and mule deer just cause I had at the time, like, I'm like, do you have elk? He goes, there's elk around, but no one hunts them. And I just said, well, just get an elk tag so we have it. And so we went up there. I met with him. And he had been sending me this picture of this one muley buck the whole time. And he was saying, like, opening day is blah, blah, blah. This is opening day. Make sure you're here. And I said, like, dude, I can't. I can't take vacation in August. It was, <laughs> it was not allowed. So I had to wait till September 1st which was like a week after season, you know, September 1st vacation was back on the plate for employees, but during August, because it was our busiest month, yep. we couldn't. So I freaking got on plane, flew to Canada and you know, Donnie's, I'm like, dude, I can't wait to see that buck. And he's like, Oh, he's right in here. <laughs> he had already killed that sucker. Oh. Cause he's like, he's like, dude, someone would have killed that buck. I had him too patterned and stuff. <laughs> so he shot this really cool buck with these deep, deep forks. And, um, so we ended up going out and Donnie, like Donnie and all of his buddies had never seen someone shoot a hundred yards and he had this moose target. And so when I got there, I do what I do at every camp, shot a couple at 20. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like, after I shot a few at 20, he, he like kind of was shooting and I just was waiting. And then when he was done, he's like, are you still wanting to shoot? I go, yeah, I want to back it up. And he's like, what do you mean? I just said, well, I want to check my scale. I want to make sure like 
my ballistic scale is on. So I said, I'm going to shoot my closest and my furthest. So then I went back to a hundred yards and he had this big moose target. Cause he had like a little 3d club there. And I just reined in this bomb at a hundred yards and I was shooting white veins with pink fletching then. And you could just see it the whole way and freaking hit. And then, uh, He's just like, holy cow, dude, that's a freaking like 10 ring or whatever. And I said, (laughs) I go, yeah, that's, I said, that's good. That's where it's supposed to be. And then, uh, cause he had never seen a slidable sight. I had my Sherlock, Sherlock. you know, with a lethal weapon head on it. And then I shot the next one and it like cut a freaking, uh, cause I was shooting whack-ums. Like okay. The yes. very first Wackums. Yes. And uh, for those who don't under know, that's like a striker. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. S- slice the vein off, and um, I just said, "Let's go hunting, dude." And <laughs> so we got in the truck and started going out, and we literally come across this. Uh, I'm trying to think what it was. Wheat. We're going across this wheat field, and like as we're driving, I look and I said dude, there's a big rack out there. And he said, what? And he like slowed down. I said, look, there's a big rack out there. And he's like, dang, that's my brother's place. And he said, "Um, oh yeah, that's just an elk. And I go, there's just an elk like bedded out (laughs) in the weeds. And he goes, yeah, they they do. And I said, I go, do, um, I said, dude, can like, can we hunt? He goes, yeah. He's like, well, he goes, well, let's just see if he's interested. And he like steps out of the truck and just starts doing a hoochie mama, like <laughs> over the top of the truck. And this bull, like you could see the rack and it's about 200, 250 yards off the road. You could see the rack just swing around and then up stands this bull and he's just looking and he starts coming and I'm just like, what in the heck is happening? <laughs> Because at that time, you know, this is this is almost 20 years ago. One, there was way less elk. Like, Alberta has awesome elk. You know, they do have amazing elk. They're not on the high end, but when it comes to, like, someone that wants to learn how to elk hunt, it's a great place. And I've said that a lot of times. So this thing starts coming, and I'm freaking out. I'm like, he's looking at us. You know, I'm just freaking. I'm like, dang, dude, you blew it. We could have stalked him, you know. He's just like, I don't know. And they all kind of came probably halfway to us and then just realized, like, that's a car calling to us. So he just turns around, but he wasn't freaked out. And he just started heading back and went back out there and bedded down. So I said, let's try to hunt that thing. We got out, went down the down the timber line, kind of got the wind right. And then, you know, I said, just give it like 30 minutes. Started calling again. And uh, sucker stood up, started coming. And like Donnie didn't know how to like fall back and call. And he did and he didn't have a call, which is it was a hoochie mama. And at the time, which later he ended up winning like the Canadian championship for elk calling. Like you fast forward five years, this is what like tricked it off. Um and he, he ended up getting in some trouble too. Like full disclosure, I don't hunt with Donnie anymore <laughs> once he like <laughs> kind of you know he made some mistakes of people that just got too deep into, into hunting. And, uh, but anyway, we're going down there and this bull would come and he would stop. He would literally stop at like outside of bow range. Let's just say that, you know, and then he would stop and he would sit there and bugle and bugle and bugle and bugle. And I'd be like looking back at Donnie, like, freaking keep going backwards and just pull him to me but like it wasn't registering how a collar should work so anyway this bull would leave and go away and he'd come up and he'd say how close did he get i'd tell him and i said dude like when he comes you have to fall back well anyway this happened like three times and he would fall back like five yards not like 50 yards you know so this bull was like getting leery and then honestly i was just getting like all right sucker like you're standing there bugling you like you're not spooked but he would stand there broadside and bugle and bugle and bugle and bugle and then finally i'm just like all right that's what you want to do and i freaking (laughs) just launched a bomb and freaking heart shot this thing and donnie was actually uh filming it and he ran out there 
and spun around about three or four times and freaking fell over. And <laughs> Donnie was like, oh, my God. Like, he couldn't freaking believe it. And it was like the first elk he had ever seen. And, you know, like that we had to break down and everything. And so, yeah, just started this. Um, and then through that, I ended up meeting um, – I ended up meeting uh, Todd, who has Red Willow Outfitters, and like with that Hunter Host tag, you know, it's only you can only get it every so many years. I forget what the rules are. So like once I did that, like I wasn't gonna be able to go back to Alberta and hunt. And then you know, Donnie told me, "Hey, you need I can hook you up with our local outfitter, and if you hunt with him, you can come to the area, and then I can I can like put eyes out for you, and I can scout." So that's when I started hunting for Red Willow Outfitters, like all the way back then, because like I had the bug right then. And I ended up, um, I ended up shooting a mule deer on that same hunt. And I was like, just hooked with Canada. That was it. That was like being hooked. But once I met him and seen his shop, I knew like Badlands is going to freaking kill here because like I think I the next time I came into rotation to where I could hunt there, or maybe the next time I was up there, I actually took Darren, and we both had the packs. And then that's when I said, like, I got the guy that can freaking roll numbers for packs. And that was great. I mean, you got to remember, I'm coming into Badlands as a sales manager, green, not knowing anything about being a sales manager for a company. I mean, you know, I – graduated high school with probably a junior high you know level okay yeah. and i i mean i was completely you know com, you know confused about how everything worked and what was funny about that is because how you came in and you did that for us by saying hey let me show you how many packs i can sell yeah you ruined it for anyone else that would approach me want to get a sponsorship yeah because i'm like well how many packs can you sell and they're just like well i don't know i want to check <laughs> yeah and so it kind of just ruined you know set yeah the looking tone back there. that was yeah looking back that was it where you know because i've always felt that way you know i really really appreciate the fact that when i was 18 years old matt mcpherson and joel maxfield saw me work in the booth you know i wanted i wanted a, a matthews sponsorship so bad but they were there was like better semi pros moving into the pro class. There was there was better archers out there. But I knew that even though I wasn't good, I knew how quick I was going to get good. Like I could, it was just like I knew it was coming. And uh, I ended up working a booth for. I ended up helping Matthews tear down a booth and everything. And I was just and I was talking to people and I was telling them. Um, I was a high country dealer, couldn't sell Matthews. I sold high countries and then I shot high countries for a while until I had, I had an, an explosion at an ASA world championship at the, that's back when some of the first synthetic strings came out. And so one of the strings was called S four and I always called it C four because <laughs> so the way that material worked, it was so coarse. It was unbelievable because there was no stretch, none. When you built a string or when I built a string, there was no stretch. You put it on and like where it was when it was on there, that's where it stayed. But it was also like, I refer to it like a paper clip, you know, like once you start bending it, like if you bend it laterally like this, after enough times, it just goes like, it's not like you see it start to bend and stretch out or anything like that. It just breaks. And so from going around the, some of the corners of the cams back when we didn't machine them as good as an industry, <laughs> just when S4 would detonate, it would just boom. And I had, you know, two, two cam bows, I had hatchet cams. So the hatchet cams, like they had to be in time or your bow wouldn't shoot worth a dang. So that like S4 was kind of the thing. And so I remember pulling back and I was aiming at this target on the practice range the day before the shoot. And all of a sudden freaking boom, just this explosion. And I, and I like, didn't know what happened. I felt parts of like the arrow hit me. And then I looked and my cable had broke 
and like it had launched the arrow. It launched the arrow. I was shooting a bow doodle rest. It like hit the bow doodle rest, skipped up, and I had a super D uh, lens. The, I don't know if you ever saw those <laughs> specialty archery product, yeah. the super Ds. They were freaking huge. I mean, it was as big. They, those things were like as big as the top of that freaking Yeti <laughs> cup right there. And I shot my arrow went hit the freaking rest, broke in half. The point of the arrow went through my super super D scope like literally shattered the glass, went through that, broke the housing. And then my, uh, the back of the shaft ended up part of it, like went through my hand and I was just, you know, this is when I was sleeping out of my car going to shoots. <laughs> so I had nothing. So, um, Sonny chapel ended up giving me his backup Matthews. It was a Matthews conquest. And it was when the max cam had first came out. And I freaking took that thing and ended up in the, I ended up tied for first at the worlds and I it ended up coming into a, we shot, we were still tied. And then there was one target left. And I remember, um, at the time it was Wayne Pearson and I was either semi-pro or like open. Can't remember, but we ended up having to shoot this mountain lion. I remember doing it we were in like a horse arena and he's like, okay, this is closest to center gets it. That's it. And we ended up, it was a mountain lion. And I remember it was 36 yards. My dad was actually, um, came, my dad had drove down. Cause I told him like, I'm freaking in the finals. Like I could be a world champion tomorrow. <laughs> and so my dad drove down from South Carolina and I remember I freaking shot just under the 12 and shot an eight and you know, Shot like that far under, shot an eight. One, the next guy stepped up, shot a twelve, and, the, and then the other guy just looked at me. and Goes, well, I'm just playing it safe and getting second. <laughs> and he freaking <laughs> shot the ten. And I ended up third, but I did it with this Matthews, and I freaking loved it. So I I talked to Matthews. I had the Chapel Brothers call Matthews. You know, actually George Dixon had met me and like called Matthews, and they're like, we're full, we're totally full. And so I just thought, like, I got to just freaking work for it. And so we ended up that that was in August, that world championship. Then fast forward to January, I went to the ATA show and I went as a dealer. You know, it was like my first year at, at having the dealership. I would have been nine or 10 months into being a, a an archery dealer selling high countries. And because there was a Matthews dealer close by that I couldn't get Matthews and, uh, I just, I came in, they needed help setting up their booth. I could tell they needed help. So I started helping and I was talking to other pros there too, but then people started asking about the bows. And so I just started telling people like, you know, here, here's my experience. Like I, I won, you know, I was literally in contention to be a world champion with, with the Matthews the very first time I ever shot one, you know, and it wasn't even my bow. You know, it wasn't my bow. That was probably the start of me being able to shoot other people's bows probably better than I shoot my own, right? And so I came back from that, and uh, Matt McPherson called me and said, and offered me a job. And at the time, he was like, hey, we have two sales reps. You know, we're looking, we're looking for sales assistance to, like, help these guys with their paperwork. And he just said, I feel like you were so personal. Like, would you come? I ended up telling him no, like three times. Cause I said, I just started a shop, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, Matt, I think Joel ended up calling, uh, calling me and he said, Hey, we're going to offer you one free bow and one bow at half off. And then we're going to give you two polo shirts and two hats. If you want to shoot for Matthews. And dude, I freaking jumped on that. I was so pumped. Two and shirts and a hat. You're like, I'm all dude, in. Dude, I did. <laughs> and I drove, so I got, I, I ordered it and I was so freaking pumped and I wanted to shoot it in Gainesville, Florida, February. So I said, I'm, I'm coming up to get a load of bulls because we actually got bulls um, out of a town just south of Minneapolis, St. Paul, because we did indoor bull riding all winter long. <laughs> And I clowned and I, and I did archery and I practiced archery in our, in our big horse barn. And so I just said, I've got to come up and get a big load of bulls up in Minnesota. I'm going to be driving through Sparta on the way home. Let me stop. So I went up, got this load of bulls. 
driving back through Sparta. I pulled in and like, you know, freaking pulling like I had like 15 bulls, <laughs> you know, stuffed in this freaking trailer. They're all out in front of Matthews freaking rattling that trailer around, you know, shitting out on the side and everything. <laughs> and Matt was like, once again, just like, dude, you know, come work for us. Like, come up here. And I just said, I can't leave my family. Like, who's going to be pulling these bulls around and stuff like that, you know? And so then uh, Larry pulled in in a truck. This is the very first block target. He pulled up to Matthews while I'm standing outside with Joel Maxfield. We're standing in front of Matthews, and, like, we're, we're literally saying bye. And this guy pulled in, and he's like, hey, do you guys work for Matthews? And Joel's like, yeah, I work for Matthews. I'm general manager, Joel. And he said, hey, I just came up with this idea for an archery target. He goes, I wanted to know what you thought about it. And it was the first block target with, like, steel bands around it. He had a, <laughs> he had a couple of them in the back of his truck. And, I, and he said, like, it's layered foam, so, like, you can shoot broadheads in it. You can shoot field points in it. He's like, you know, if you want to shoot field points, you just turn them up at like the layers up and down like this, and they'll pull easier. Shoot broadheads, turn it this way. And it had like a, pretty much a dog, like a dang dog leash <laughs> nailed to the top piece of wood. Actually, I don't even know if the first one had a piece of wood on top. It had like a real crappy handle. I remember that. And he's like, would you buy one of these? And I said, I'd buy one right now. And he goes, what would you give for it? And I'm like, 50 bucks because i had i had my mom had gave me 200 bucks to like drive up and get these bulls and have gas money and so i had just filled up in sparta like right then and i had like i think i had like 50 bucks and some 20s in my pocket and i knew i was only an hour and a half from home so i'm like give me 50 bucks <laughs> and i bought the first block target out of the back of the truck it might not even have been Larry. It might have been Brad, like Larry's first partner. It was kind of crazy. But honestly, like working for someone from the very beginning, like putting in the work of that booth, that is 100% what got me that contract of going to give you one bow. You have to buy a bow, mm -hmm. but we're going to give you that two shirts two and shirts. two hats. So, I mean, I honestly, like, once I started at Matthews, I started to realize the importance of what you do as an ambassador or yes. professional. Like, it, it has effect on people inside that are gunning, for, that are not, you know, that are on your side. Like, yeah. saying, this guy can help the company. This guy helps the company. This, this girl does a freaking unbelievable job locally. Okay. And you have to be able to show your value somewhere. And if you don't, then honestly, I think it's killed a lot of companies for people like giving stuff to ambassadors they think are cool, mm -hmm. you know, or they follow or they look up to, but then they don't do the due diligence of, is this person out here to help us or are they out here to help them? And there's, there's not a lot out there that are like, Hey, this is, this, this is both ways. I've got to help them first. If I help them first and they're doing good, then then they're going to see my value and I'll grow with them if I'm growing them first. It's just a very different mentality. Oh, definitely. I mean, well, that's one of the things you see. You know, working when I then you know, working at Easton and working with some individuals, it was to the point to where you know you see those individuals are. Uh, well, I need you to share my stuff. I need you to like my stuff. And it's, you start realizing, wait a second, you're using Easton to grow you, mm -hmm. you know, not you, you know, not trying to help grow the brand. Yeah. And that's what you see a lot of now. I remember that vividly. Um, one time I, I didn't have a lot of in-depth conversations with Randy Walk, but I remember one time him telling me, he he kind of just I, I came up to him and there there was something going on at the Hoyt booth and I think um I kind of think he was just watching someone interact like you know someone that they had there signing autographs or whatever and he just had like kind of the savvy to know he just said you know what's weird about this is you know these people come here and you know we bring them on to help grow Hoyt 
but then they just want Hoyt to grow them, grow them, grow them. And he said, and then that person, he's kind of pointing, he said, then the next step is they will then use what we built of them against us to try to go to someone else. And he said, it, it's just a weird, he said, it's such a weird parallel. And, and it's true. It's very true. And it's one of the things that I think somewhat hurts, you know, somewhat hurts the industry. I agree. You know, I feel like, I feel like people that do enough for a company to where the company reaches out and says, you know, Hey, thanks for what you're doing. What could we do to, you know, to pay you back? Yeah. That's a better position to be in, I think. Oh yeah. All right. So let's move forward to your first mule deer because it was a beast. Well, I was actually my second. Was that the second? Second and my third. The second and third were crazy. Yes, they were. Everyone needs to keep in mind that everyone at Hoyt was legit diehard Wasatch front hunters. Yes. They, they freaking spent a lot of time. And for people who are listening don't know, I mean, the, so the Wasatch front is an area in Utah where they basically shut it down the rifle hunting and they made it an archery only unit and they let it run until the end of November. And what a, the reason they did that was to keep the deer from coming into the city. But by doing that, making an archery only unit throughout the years, they kind of turned it into a trophy unit. Oh yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it's rough train, you know, no horses, no ATVs. It's you have rough. To walk it's in there. It's a hundred percent rough. And it's steep. I mean, you're gaining, you know, two miles, you're gaining 2000 feet, you know, vertical. I mean, you know, within two miles. So it's a, pretty tough hunt and that you know that area produced some pretty good mule deer and you know i shot my first deer was you know 07 and it was just a four point and from there it just i was obsessed it was very upset you know, i was very obsessed with it and after that my so my second mule deer i shot was in 2009 and i shot him and he was a 30 32 inch four point is what it, what he was now i'm just tell you everyone with doesn't matter i could care less but here's the thing growing up for a mule deer okay what did you judge it by oh with all the way and body size yeah i wanted yeah. i wanted a 30 inch deer yeah that's the wisconsin mentality it's, how wide is it yeah. What's that thing weigh? <laughs> exactly. Like that's all everyone that's all at the bar said. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, I shot that deer and that first deer, I'll never forget it because, you know, it was, I was with Clint Warner and he's actually, you know, he's at Easton. Yeah. And I didn't know you were with Clint. Yeah. I was with Clint on that. Oh my so gosh. So Clint, uh, Alex Cole introduced us and Clint just invited himself to come hunting with me. I'm like, okay, guy, right on. Cause only a lot of people didn't. And Clint came along and he said, have you ever rattled? I'm like, no. He goes, well, we should try rattling. I'm like, well, I'm like whatever. So I go, I've been seeing this deer now. I saw him, I've been hunting this deer for like over two months because, again, you can hunt from August till the end of November. And I saw him in, over there and I could never get on him. I mean, and then I found out two other local guys were hunting him. So we were all hunting this deer, and it was Who like was a big it? chase. Was it someone I know? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like Monson or Dixon or anyone? No, though, I, I don't think those guys knew. They may have, but no, it was, uh, God, who was it? I think it was J a guy named Jason. Jason and an, another guy named Scott. I mean, they've killed some deer over there, but I don't think it's anyone you really know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so we go up in that area, and we're, you know, and Clint goes, I'm going to start rattling. I'm like, fine. So what does he do? He breaks out, you know, starts rattling. And I'm finally just, I grab a sandwich out of my, you know, backpack. I'm like, this guy's making so much noise. This is embarrassing. Oh man, I'm sitting there eating my sandwich. And I'm like, let's get out of here. And I said, so I go around this corner. I've usually seen him hang out. So we wrap the corner and there he is with two does. So he goes, I'm going to start rattling. Like, go for it. So he starts rattling and what happens is another deer, this buck, came right at us. I'm like, oh, I'm like, holy shit, where did this thing come from? Yeah. And I was behind this big pine tree, and there's snow on the ground. And that buck, you know, came, finally saw us, took off. Well, the big buck, you know, the four point, his does came to us, and he went above the does and started pushing them around. And so then I finally saw him, and I remember I drew up on him. 
My leg was shaking so bad. My arm was shaking. I just fired that shot. And the snow was so deep, the arrow just goes in the snow. And he didn't do anything. Meantime, Clint's still rattling. Oh, my God. All right. <laughs> knock another arrow. Part. I knock another arrow. Shaking. Just <laughs> over him. Into the snow. Dude, twice. <laughs> twice. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. He finally takes a step, and his head goes behind the tree. I'm like, okay, I got this. <laughs> Knocked an arrow, shot, and I hit far back. And I just, I hit him, and that deer just turned around and came straight at us. And I just froze. I mean, I'm just froze. I'm like, the son bitch is run me over. Yeah. But I didn't know what to do. And he ran by, and I just remember seeing blood squirt out the back like crazy. And sure enough, man, I'm like, I'm all pumped i'm all oh my god oh my god and and clint i mean if you ever met clint he's just a real chill guy he's yeah. like calm down it's good it's good and i'm like okay we we, we gotta go look we, we gotta go look he's like give it some time relax and i'm just amped up <laughs> and the 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 funny part of that story is we went there because this, this is all public land yeah so when we got up to the top of that mountain over there we were glassing and there's a little knob we all glass from well there are other guys there so you know, i started glassing with them just on that knob and the guy was pissed off and he said he goes out of all the hills you know you gotta sit here next to me and i go hey i just i'm trying not to go up there and blow out that area so i'm just staying down low and he said so he goes you're not what he say he goes so unsportsmanlike and he was pissed i'm like well fine i'll leave all right i mean so we left and then that whole situation went down i shot that deer so Tell we, me that guy was at the bottom when you brought that So <laughs> we're looking. No, we're trailing the deer, trailing the deer. I come around the corner. I see him across the field. And I'm like, shit, there he is. And I'm just tunnel vision watching that blood trail. And it stopped. And I see that guy over there to my right. And I'm just like, oh, no. And look to the left and deer is piled up. Oh, my left. God. <laughs> Did you say, hey, dude? Oh, you know I did. <laughs> and, 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 that guy, and the guy comes over and he goes, I guess that's what I get for being an asshole. Oh, did he? Good, Good for he him. Did. Good yep. for him. But from that day on, anybody on that hill he saw, he would he'd go, do you know Isaac from Badlands? You know he shot this deer from underneath me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know his name. It, but to that day, anybody on that hill goes, Hey, I ran into this guy <laughs> because the way the Wasatch Front is, I mean, it's like a 20 minute drive from Salt Lake. Yeah. It's a, you know, common trails. I mean, a lot of people hunt it. And I mean, even now it's worse now trying to hunt that area. I mean, there's people there all the time. And, but you know, you start recognizing the same faces, you know, there's one way in, you know, one way out. So whenever anybody would go up there, that guy made a point to let him know that I shot his deer. <laughs> Good for you. And then the, following year i was checking out a bigger buck i found a bigger buck earlier that summer and you sent me uh like well i don't think phone scope was going on then, no i was all you, shaky yeah you <laughs> sent me something you're like dude you think the buck i shot last year was big wait do you see what i got this year because yep. you went like it went from how in the freak did isaac kill a buck that big to three years from that date it it's like, oh, if you want to kill a big buck on the Wasatch, you need to talk to Isaac. <laughs> That's what I was telling people. You better talk to Isaac. Well, and the following year in 2000, you know, 2010, uh, I was just looking for that deer constantly, and I saw another deer come out. He came through a herd of elk, and he's a three-point. And I really didn't know how to gauge him, and I just went up to scout the morning, and that was it. And I saw that deer, and I went up after him like, I'm a, a three point for my third deer. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. So I, you know, I end up shooting that deer at a long distance and he beast. And I remember I hit him because again, you know, I hit him and he dropped, he fell back, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm the man. <laughs> and he got up, took off running. I'm like, where the fuck are you going? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. And he went into the snow patch and I was, I called my buddies and like, guys, I just hit a deer. You got to come on up. And so I went over there and I finally see, you know, found the deer bed and he was running up the hill and I'm flinging arrows at him. And God. he finally just, you know, like I, you know, steep angles yeah. where you know, the trees grow out and there's a little shelf there. Yeah. He was there and I finally seen him just, he goes down and I was out of food. I was out of water. 
And I told my buddies, I'm like, I just shot a three point. And they're like, okay, cool. And they're hiking up in the snow. And he goes, sick. The other guy called me sick. They're like, sick, why the hell you shoot a three point all the way up here? And I remember when I pulled his head out of the snow, the look <laughs> on their faces. And I didn't realize how big he was at the time because I was tired. I was hungry. And it was like he ended up being a you know thirty two inches one eighty three point. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that was so. that is so freaking rad. Yeah, I remember that. I remember talking to uh, to Dar- Darren and and Daniel, and uh, they they said, "Dude, freaking Isaac just killed like the biggest three by three I've ever put my hands like I've ever seen." <laughs> So it was, yeah, and, and what was cool is you're like, yeah, I shot him because I knew I hadn't shot a three-point before. <laughs> <laughs> well, thir- a three-point for my third buck. Oh, nice. So that's what my whole thinking was. That is awesome. And then, I mean, that's the last mule deer I killed, though. That was? Yes. Well, so, Dang. The, well, the situation is I started. Well, at, you're you're at, out, at, out there for your boy, too. Well, yeah, my boy started hunting, but I got real picky, and I still, I would see big bucks. I mean, that following year, there's another wide buck that was there. And I'm thinking, well, shoot, I, I could sneak that arrow in through there. I'm Isaac, man. I could kill anything. And yep. Man, blowing stocks. Because, like I said, I started hunting in 05. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I took those deer back to back. So, I'm like, in my mind, I'm a great hunter. You know? <laughs> and now I was experiencing, you know, prop, you know, uh, you know, equipment malfunctioning. I mean, yeah. dealing with all that. A matter of fact, I mean, remember, I called you on the mountain when I missed yeah. the biggest deer of my life. Yeah. So, <laughs> due to yeah. a little flaw. <laughs> yeah, you were, that was a, that was a bad day for Isaac right yes. there. Well, okay, we're getting close on time. So, is there anything you want to talk about or is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? Well, first, I want to thank you for basically your friendship because look where it's landed me now in the in the podcast studio in the podcast studio but look at the company i'm working for now yeah which is super cool black but, rifle because i went from badlands back to easton i was easton for seven years due to budget cuts they you know my job was eliminated and i remember you're the second phone i called my wife and then i called you and i'll never forget i called you because hey i'm no longer at easton and you said call evan black rifle yep and sure enough i think i said call evan but in you know maybe give him like 30 minutes yes which you didn't know that was that meant i'm gonna call evan and say i've got your archery guy yes you know because you i just know the type of people that evan likes and i also know like how unbelievable the growth of archery within the veteran community is right now and you know Black Rifle, you know, JT, Matt, Tom, Logan, Evan, all, everybody, right? Everybody there. It's just the perfect family for me to be able to say, oh, you know someone that needs archery? Like, tell me where I need to be to help them. And then now, like, Black Rifle is freaking like almost everybody in there shoots bows now. Right? Oh yeah, I mean you're looking at a, I mean, I mean you're looking at the owner of a company that went and said, "All right, go buy bows from PSE." Buys what? Well, how many? You know, buys the knock to it, gives them to me and my son. So my son now works at Black Rifle Coffee. Yep. And full disclosure here is funny thing was when I he when I went to Evan he put me on as a contractor, put me on a retainer, uh, first. And then my son was helping him build bows. They hired my son before they hired me. Word up. So, and because people will say, because, you know, there has been some people that said, oh, you're just riding your dad's coattails to my son. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. No, <laughs> he got hired before me. Because I remember when they offered him a job and gave him an offer letter in August. I'm like, guys, I'm still contracting. <laughs> What's a, hello? That's I'm awesome. like, What's going on here? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of you. And he got hired first. <laughs> That is freaking savage right there. Yeah. That's a classic Evan move too. So but so with my boy being the full time bow tech over there, Evan buy, buys bows for the company and he tells us, give them to employees. Yeah. I mean what a knock to a, a brand new PSE embark. Yeah. I mean and tells them, let's go and shoot. Yeah. And I mean we talked a lot about obviously some of our past was, you know, 
Hoyt, Matthews, um, how it was all intertwined. But, you know, now, like, when I left Hoyt and looked at everybody and shot, you know, uh, last year I shot every bow again. I got a bow from everywhere. I shot them all. And then, and I also had conversations with multiple people. And my vibe at PSC was like, because they're very veteran oriented too. Yes. Like they are very veteran oriented. Pete freaking, you know, does a lot for Pete. Pete is a good, like a very soft heart, good will person. And he has just the most dynamic group of individuals around him that freaking no matter what is going on, whether the wind's blowing at the, your back or whether the wind's in your face or whether the wind's totally coming from the side and near blowing you over his team freaking always like gets the boat to the landing. It, they always do. And it, it's really, it's just so refreshing to me to be part of a group that gives me the ability to create if I feel creative support if i feel supportive you know if i need bows for people like you know i can do that um i think it, it's like it's per it's like it's kind of the perfect like ending you know for me to be somewhere where i've got all the right support for people that like right now i'm just i have a this and you're obviously in that group now thankfully but like I just have this amazing group of people that are fanatic about archery. It's very therapeutic to them yep. to where it's not business. It's a hundred percent pleasure and it's allowing me to have pleasure again out of archery. It's allowing me to not like have the political BS that I need to worry about or anything like that. It's like, I just have this ridiculous support network that's allowing me to like see opportunities to grow the sport of archery or help people. And there's tons of other companies around it, whether it's, you know, bird at Sorenex or, you know, Jocko bringing in people he knows or, you know, Andy or, you know, Sika, you name it. Like I've got so much awesome support and then, you know, it's just a, it's a perfect community. And then you top that off with, like the knock on nation, you know, obviously everybody watching this, everybody listening, everybody, you know, watching the instructional stuff, it's freaking overwhelming. And it's like, it's overwhelmingly hum humbling. If that's two <laughs> words that go together, well, like, that's what it is. Well, you're changing the way archery is kind of viewed in a way, because before, you know, me coming into it, you either had to be a hardcore hunter or you had to be, uh, you know, elitist professional shooter, right? Yeah. And there was really not much for, like, for 3D shoots and everything. There wasn't, you know, for us guys who just like to hunt and shoot and have fun, it was really not a place for us. And now with you and Total Archery Challenge kind of putting that, bringing it in the middle, and then the people we're working with, like Black Rifle Coffee and everyone, yeah. I mean, Evan says, have fun. We'll go shoot. He said, we're not keeping score. Yeah, and there's people out there who are, are are like, "Why are you shooting a 3D course? You don't keep score at because it's fun." Yeah, I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to to be better, and if I can come off that mountain without eating an arrow up, like yeah. I just was a hundred percent on a hunting season in my mind. Like exactly. that's what you're. I was a hundred percent during a year long hunting season with like twenty five tough freaking shots. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's un unreal. I mean, and like, like the relationship, you know, between my son and I, I mean, you know, you've, you've got to meet him and, you know, yeah. he's got to, I mean, here he is 21 years old hanging out with me now. Dude, dorking out. Dork. Oh Dork, man. He's right, like, right now he is freaking, he's going to be this kid that like gets <laughs> to talk about like when his dad, like was a freaking stage manager from Metallica <laughs> and he was always freaking there just getting a freaking ride out the concerts and all the parties. And well, that was the best. I'll like, I, I told you the story. He, he was where he, he got out of high school, was a bow tech at Shields and he came home one day and he's like, so dad, Hey, do you know John Dudley? 
because again, he grew up in the archery industry, you know, knowing people. Yeah. He goes, Dad, do you know John Dudley? And I go, son, John Dudley knows me. <laughs> like, really? I'm like, yes, son. <laughs> I go, you've met him at the Western Hunt Expo. I did? I'm like, yes. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> he was that freakishly tall person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, you know, it's great. I mean, this community, we're going, you know, we've been built and, you know, what you've been doing. I mean, from selling DVDs out of your, you know, out of your trunk of your car. Dude, giving, trading DVDs, <laughs> like we were hustling right yes. then. Trading DVDs to give away in backpack repairs. Exactly. From there to remember the knock on TV show, you you tried doing the TV show because the, the you know progression I did the was the TV show. Yep, you did the TV show. Yeah. So it went DVD TV show to this. I mean, you've been at this for a while. Yeah, this was been, not some overnight success. No. I mean, you've been hustling for a long time, and holy shit, look at this place now! <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. What's crazy is um, when I first was on TV, like after the second year at the sportsman's channel, I could see what they were doing with rates and what they were doing with hunting television and what they were making the TV shows and producers do. And I told them, I said, this is a hundred percent a dying business plan because I know internally if I was, if I was at any company I was with, which at the, you know, I still, for, I still consult for a lot of companies that I don't even talk about, you know, but I consult for companies, and I knew dang good and well that this model to charge this much, this much, this much, this much, and then charge the show X amount, and the only thing you're really giving them is commercial time. But then the network, to fill their gaps on blank time, they would undercut the TV shows, and they would sell remnant ad space back to the manufacturers for a third of the price of as what the TV show, you know, like for me, I knew if I bought this time slot, I literally have six minutes that I can sell to Matt, to advertisers. And so if I take my costs and I divide it up by that and I, you know, figure out what a 60 second time slot is worth. And then you get, and then it's like, okay, Hey, whoever, this is how much it's going to cost. But then all of a sudden that same channel goes behind you and tells that company, Hey, if you want to just buy remnant spots where we're going to just put you everywhere where there's a free opening <laughs> and it's going to be like 70% less money. Well, guess what? Now your value to the manufacturer is like, it's, it's a losing battle. The only people that are going to remain in that business model are the ones that are willing to pay a lot of money to see themselves on TV. Yeah. And, and honestly, I'm like, I don't, I've fought the whole time to try to educate. Like I want, I want to educate for free. I want to talk about how people can get better. I want to, that's all I want to talk about. I don't care about like water flowing through a Creek or like cool birds flying <laughs> through the air. Like if there's, if there's not an arrow launching through the air at something, then I need to be like teaching somehow. Yep. And it, it just got very, you know, very clear to me of, you know, Hey, you're not going to, you're not going to pay, you know, you're, I'm not willing to spend to see myself. What I, all I want to do is if there's a small crowd that are willing to listen and people come and get better, then like, Hey, that's my thing. It's just right now that nucleus is, you know, bigger than I'd ever hoped for. But it also just has ridiculous synergy with people like, you know, people like Evan, people like Barklow, people like Jonathan Hart, like people like Sloan at Yeti, like all these people that recognize this nucleus of, you know, if we're supporting each other and we're yep. supporting people who are helping grow the industry, then the industry is getting strong. But yes. the other way was like a freaking, it was like a slow liver leak. To the industry oh yeah it, it's killing it yep like it's killing it it's a liver shot it's like it's freaking <laughs> back and low yep <laughs> you know and like right now the industry's like got a gut ache but yes. eventually it's gonna freaking kill it oh yeah the way the way it was going so bro i freaking love you man i love you too yeah. man this has been great <laughs> this has been so fun we didn't even talk about shooting i'll talk to junior about all the shooting yeah let stuff. him talk to him about the shooting that because he's you know he's excited about this and i mean for him growing up and i mean look 
like I, I told him, right now you and I are traveling across the country to shoot archery, do archery stuff together and get paid for it. I go, son, nothing lasts forever, so just make sure we enjoy these yeah, moments. Yeah, heck yeah. Because this is a dream come true that I you know, never thought could happen. Uh, and here we are, my son and I, side by, and then hanging out with you, watching you kind of grow to where you are now. Even Sharon. Like, yeah. we were talking when, when, when I first went to Badlands. Um, we went out, and you're like, hey, we want to make a pack for a lady. Because Sharon hated wearing guys' backpacks because yep. she's so petite. So we went out. Me and Sharon went to Badlands. You guys measured her, and Harry was there and was just like little, I mean, little, little, little. So, yeah, it's just been so cool to see it all develop because, like, Sharon just experienced all that stuff with us, too. She's well, been through the whole thing. And it's great because, well, one thing, too, you've always stayed real. I mean, you know, different jobs I've had and everything, I mean, you've always just been straight a real legit friend to me. Yeah. Because they're guys, they're people in this industry where I get a position where I can't help them anymore. They're gone. Yeah, oh, yeah. They're gone. I mean, as soon as I couldn't write that check or couldn't give them free product, they're gone. And here I am, I mean. I love it when well, people do that. The sooner the better. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, honestly, the sooner the better. It's like, hey, if you're, if you're very one-dimensional, like, freaking let me know. Because I, I, want, I want less friends that are freaking solid. You exactly. Know? Um, it, it's because I can't <laughs> talk to all of them too. I mean, I feel it's almost like I don't want don't that need, many good don't friends because I can't need any more be friends. a good friend back. <laughs> yeah. I can't be a good I friend agree. back. And that's, I meet some like newer people that I meet. It's like, Hey, I don't, I'm not saying this to be a dink or anything, but like, I don't have enough time to talk to how many like good friends that I have. And I love it when I travel and when I drive, because I can actually call people and just be like, hey, man, I know I haven't got to talk to you for a while. <laughs> like, even Rogan, there, like, there's times where Rogan will just call me and just be like, bro, you good? What are you up to? And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, any second I could pick up and call Joe and check in. But I also know, like, he freaking works his ass off, and I work my ass off. Same with Jocko. But it's like when we see each other, like we know those times are coming where we're going to have like 100% downtime. So we don't like have the pressure on each other of like checking in all the time. But, and well, I'm thinking they're, they're your friends too where you cannot talk for a few months and pick up right where you left oh, yeah, off. Those yeah. are true friends Freaking right just there. laughing at someone else. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Knock all right. on everybody. Be sure to check out knockonarchery.com for our full line of custom designed products as well as free in-depth education and bow hunting entertainment to help you shoot at your best. <laughs>